Yeah, gotta aim for the top like Hold up, yeah I can never doubt myself, I know better All of you critics be acting like you know better Blowing the smoke, but I know when it does settle Said I'm in my element, it's everything that this level to the game So what's happening, people? Welcome back to the Athletes to Athletes podcast. This is the first one of 2024, and I brought the men of A2A back with me to discuss another topic. As we said at the end of our final episode of 2023, we were going to be doing this a lot more where we're bringing some of the most headline topics, some that you know probably aren't even headline topics, and we're going to discuss them. We're going to break them down. We're going to kind of give our own takes on them. And Today's question, essentially, is why is the transfer portal open essentially during the biggest and most penultimate time during the biggest revenue-generating sport, which is college football? Why is the transfer portal window, since they've proclaimed it a window now, why is that open? Why are we doing... Essentially, as as Joel Klatt said in the video that that we all watched to kind of prep for this... Why are they doing the draft during the season? It doesn't really make much sense. So, um, fellas, let's dig into this. What, what are your thoughts around the transfer portal window being open during such a important time in college football that everyone used to look forward to with bowl season and the championships? I think it gives us a lot more headlines. Not sure that was the the core reason, but there's certainly a lot to talk about during bowl season that both includes and doesn't include teams that really hold any relevance in playoffs or or anything like that. So that's interesting. I do think the important thing to contextualize before we dive into this, though, is that once again, football and predominantly FBS football, FCS, of course, as well, is different, right? We have these windows that exist for fall sports, winter sports, and spring sports that when you look at them on paper – you know, it's these 45-day windows. It's, you know, 30 days at a certain point, 15 days at a certain point. Sometimes it's 45 days. Those are all pretty standardized, and, and those make a lot more sense. It's as if we had more time to think about those, and, and we look at FBS, FCS football, and then men's, women's basketball are, are also this way as well on the on the Division One side. That's where things start to get a little weird. It's it's the it's the revenue sports that, that seem to cause us a lot of problems here for some reason. And I don't, you know... It appears as though we just, it's like everyone just made snap decisions whenever they were going through the process to try and get ahead of it. It didn't really take the time to think about what the impact was going to be, to your point, on high school kids trying to sign and coaches trying to finish seasons and kids trying to decide where they want to go and, and, and. And so now we've got this huge melting pot of activity going on in a four to five week period, specifically on the football side, that just. Nobody has any control over what's happening. They, they say that these rules are put in place to create windows and to create structure and to create a little bit of comfort and when things are going to happen. But when it all happens at the same time, it kind of defeats the purpose of, of having some sort of streamlined process, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, these windows were announced during this year's football season. They announced these in, in you know, the article that I shared with you guys, that was announced on October 4th. I think of 2023. So the there there we were already a couple weeks into the season. They had already been hashing this out and for a while where they decided that fall sports would have a 30 day window, winter sports would have a 45 day window and then spring sports would also have a 30 day window and then you know fall and spring sports get another 15 days uh, fall gets from May 1st to the 15th and spring gets from December 1st to the 15th. So ultimately it, it equates to being a 45 day window for each one of, you know, our, our sports categories. But why do we have it? Like I said, during this most important time, it seems like they didn't think through the, you know, and as you said, football is a completely different beast than everything else. It feels like they didn't look at their penultimate sport, and let's call it what it is. There's more hype around football than anything else. You have projections. You've you've got you know the bowl championship series. 
you've got everything in there, right? You're, and and it's the most revenue generating sport, not just for the guys in the suits and ties, but but now for the kids on the field. There's so much that is going into this, but you decide that you want to allow this essential free agency period during a very pivotal time of the season. It just doesn't make any sense. Well, I think part of it is they they got backed into a corner because of the fact that these are college student athletes, right? There's a January 8th or January 12th semester start date. So in order for college students to have the time necessary to transfer programs and academically be eligible to attend a new university in the spring, like they basically had to put it in this window. And one of the negative effects of this is, to your point, Ryan, they're doing, as as Klatt said, the draft and free agency at the, free agency at the same time. The problem with that window being the same as it is, is it also overlaps over the time in which kids are getting ready for signing day. And so now you have this transfer portal, you have this signing day for high school student athletes, and we've now made the story about who's going where for what reason, as opposed to bowl games or championships or whatever. And and I know there's there's a lot of economic impacts I'll go into later, but like bowl games don't matter as much when players don't play. And so it, it certainly has created a polarizing media narrative of like who's in the portal, why are they in the portal, are they coming back, you know, those kind of things. Um and and I, I re read as far as, you know, from a college admission standpoint, like I feel like this puts a lot of pressure on not only uh student athletes that are in college, but also high school student athletes on like knowing where they're gonna go and feeling comfortable about it because the landscape changes so irregularly and, and there's so much variability to it. Yeah, well, that's the tricky part on this, right, is that, you know, let's say for our scholarship athletes that are going to sign agreements, and that's a lot of who we're talking about when we're, when we're thinking about these sort of big transfer windows and these big transfer folks that we're hearing about, right, is these Division One programs, these bigger programs. Those, those national signing days that we have for these sports were created and, and established well before transfer portals existed. So they didn't take into consideration anything to do with, hey, how is – the college transfer realm going to affect this this particular kid's ability to sign with a school and have that spot still available for them. So we've got early signing periods, we have late signing periods. You know, I'm looking at football right now. They've got one, two, three. They've got three separate signing periods. They have a Division One early period from December 20 to December 22nd, which is a hilariously small window. They've got Division One, Division Two football for junior college transfers, which is December 20, to January 15. So there's another group of kids that are in the pot that we're trying to figure out. And then we have the regular period, which is February 7 through either April 1st or August 1st, depending on whether you're division one or division two. And so these, these numbers were put in here arbitrarily back before we had transfer portals and, and everything like that. And the reality is we need to sort of adjust what that looks like. If we're going to have a reasonable transfer portal window for folks that are moving within college, folks that are coming in on the junior college spectrum, and then folks that are coming in on the high school side, because what ultimately ends up, ends up happening is that these high school kids are a lot of times the last ones to the party, right? All these other things happen during this during this window. There's conversations. There's kids that have a ton of tape because they're on these you know Power Five or G Five programs and they're looking to transfer. They've got college stats under their belt. Those are conversations that are having. And then you look at these 17, 18 year old kids and they're trying to figure out where they fit into the pie and they're trying to figure out where their school fits because they've got to still fill out applications and they've got to do all these different things and see what they need to do to be prepared. I mean, shoot, by the time it's February, yeah, you can fill out applications, but a lot of families have, have lost opportunities at Meridaid or, or FAFSA or all these other components that, that come with making these late applications to these schools. So if you're coming in as a walk-on or maybe you lose a scholarship spot because it went to somebody else, well, now you've got a, you have a, a financial conversation to have as a family to see if that's even an option for you. And so to me, you know, it, it's this, it's this ever building block, right? You've got the NCAA with their own intentions. You have, you know, the National Letter of Intent Office, which is run by the College Commissioners Association. They've got their own sort of stake in this. You've got coaches that want to manage their own recruiting cycle with all these different places. You have ADs that are trying to manage budgets and fans and everything else. You've got 
uh, sport books that are trying to manage, you know, bowl season, especially for football mm-hmm. when it comes to, you know, shoot, when I knew that certain guys were, were opting out for certain games, it changed the way I picked my bowl pool. And I'm sure it does for people that are putting real money down and not just doing a, you know, family potluck one with, with their buddies and stuff like that. And so you have all these different layers that are coming into place. And at the end of the day, these high school football players, specifically for the topic we're talking about today, are just sort of left waiting for the scraps to fall out and seeing where they land. I mean, it, it would not surprise me at all if, if we have a much larger percentage of kids now getting called by coaches when they've got the six hats up there. You know, four of them could very well be calling that kid the day before and saying, hey, don't pick our hat. Like We filled that spot. Right. We're good to go. And so you can keep all six hats out there, but what's the real story going on here? What are the options that this kid really has when it comes out the back end? Well, economically, the other thing to, to think about is like, the impact this has on the revenue for the for the universities themselves right so take your example let's just use let's use uh florida state for example because i know that's it's ryan's team but like yeah they got all that they got all the tv revenue because the story but like when you have people backing out or or entering the portal right you have a lesser chance of winning that game or competing in that game which means you get less attendance or less ticket sales to the bowl game which means other than that florida state georgia conversation like you will usually get lesser tv ratings when your starting quarterback is not playing right and so there's this you know cascading waterfall effect of like hey if you have 20 kids into the end of the transfer portal portal tennessee had 20 20 position players enter the transfer portal still beat Iowa 35 to zero but like there's there's less excitement about the actual bowl game which which are already you know outside of the of the playoff next year are going to be just scraps of just like just just media rights right not necessarily going to mean anything um you know that becomes less and less revenue to schools so now universities if you're outside the playoff like have incentives to try to keep their players on at least for those games or try to keep them so that there's a reason to sell attendance. There's reason for Jersey sales. There's reasons for, um, you know, travel, you know, and, and getting picked for those bowls, right? Like Iowa, for example, gets picked to go to certain bowl games because they know their fan base travels versus if we, you know, if you have a school that has, you know, loses, you know, X percent of their players at the portal, there's going to be less people traveling for those games, which means less um, or lower bowl eligibility or, or, or selection uh, status. And my my thing is, right, and kind of tied up in all this, you know, with the transfer portal being open when it's open, is why do we need an early signing period? Like, why is that necessary, right? Like, you have multiple signing periods, and, and ultimately, like I said, we're talking about Division One highest level football. Mm. Why is an early signing period necessary? I mean, I understand... You know, and you know, for the for the sake of everything, yes, Florida State fan, complete cards on the table, and you know, the team had players that joined them, you know, high school players that joined them for practice during Mm -hmm. the bowl preparation, so they were able to get with the team, they were able to go through all the you know all the drills and and all the fanfare of the of the bowl game and and take in that, which is awesome experience for a kid, but he can't play. So like certainly getting that experience is great. It's awesome. And you don't get that if you don't sign early, essentially, but why is it even necessary in the midst of guys transferring? Right. And and like I said, the transfer portal window is open after conferences. It's Mm -hmm. completely negating that you still have like what a month and a half of football left there's a month and a half of the most important time of the year that is left and through that transfer portal window being open when it is the early signing period you have to get in to the portal as soon as you possibly can there's teams that are the not as good teams who were six and six were those 500 teams that got those early bowl games that I think there was a bowl game. I can't remember what team it was, but their quarterback played in the bowl game despite being in the transfer portal because he wasn't even supposed to, he was the backup. 
they were losing. They didn't want to lose, so they put him back in the game. He ended up winning the game for them, right? It, it, it made it ever, ever more efficient for him to be in that offense. But he was transferring the next week. He was still able to play because the coach allowed him to play and wanted him to play, so that's always an option. Mm-hmm. But why not take away that early signing period? Now you're not worried about that. Move that transfer portal window back to after everything. I understand you have to get kids into school for that spring semester, but they don't, they don't need to start on day one. There's, there's nowhere that I have seen that says they need to start on day one. That day one, they need to be in class in order to be part of that team that next year. Because if you think about it, those high school kids, they're still in high school at that point. So you could essentially take this entire semester off and join a team in the fall and play with them in the fall instead of, oh, I need to be in in school for the spring semester. So I don't understand what that early signing day does. It's a lot of fanfare. It's a lot of hype. It's great headlines to see, you know, oh, the number one five-star recruit out of Georgia is going to end up at, you know, Miami or or he's going to end up at Florida. He's going to end up here. Yeah, it's awesome. It's cool. But like, what does it, what does it serve? It doesn't serve a true purpose. You can take out early signing day and it doesn't change anything ultimately does not change anything in the grand scheme of things, at least in my mind. Yeah. I mean, the only thing that it changes is that coaches don't get their early signing kids on campus early. Exactly. Like you said, and really football is the only sport that I can think of that has a model like that, that, that tries to get kids in for that spring practice and different things of, of that nature. But to me, I mean, I think, I think it would be a much healthier process if to your point, we had sort of stages in this thing, right? Because the vast majority of kids, too, that, you know, will do these verbal commitments in the fall. I mean, no one really even takes them seriously anymore. I feel like I hear about them and I don't pay any attention to them until February rolls around because that's the day that the kids are on TV and they're able to do their big table spots and do all these things and really ink it in writing. I mean, there's, yeah, there's a handful of kids that, that sign early and it's usually so that they can go and compete in spring practice and that and that happens. But Outside of them getting a few more weeks of practice and coaches being able to get them on campus a little earlier, especially now with the transfer portal, I mean, it would stink for you as a player to come in thinking you're going to be the guy in some spot, be there all spring practice, and then here comes this other person from a different Power 5 or a G5 school that shows up on campus that plays your same position that's a year older than you, and now all of a sudden you're looking at the depth chart and going, this isn't what I signed up for. I thought my coach was putting me in this role to do this. And they went and found somebody who happened to be in the transfer portal that happened to help them win games a little bit faster than I could. And now I'm sitting here behind everybody else wondering what just happened. Right. And so for, so that kid who, who hasn't even ever done a full year of school at this particular college is now in a position where he feels he may have to go in the transfer portal just to give himself an opportunity. Whereas if we do this thing in stages, and we allow the transfer portal to play itself out. You know, obviously we allow the season to play itself out. We allow the transfer portal to play itself out. And then we allow the signing period to play itself out. Everyone understands what cards are being dealt and, and what decisions they need to make. And for these kids that do have multiple options, you can now reevaluate what those schools look like with the new personnel and decide if that's a place that's going to be an overall fit for you. To me, that seems like it's the most natural progression. High school kids are always going to get the bottom end of the barrel on this. Just that's the way it is now because of the transfer portal. You're not going to be able to compete physically with a 20-year-old or a 21-year-old unless you are, you know, I don't know, DK Metcalf or Leonard Fournette, like these guys that are just <laughs> built different. Yeah. Like, yeah. you know, the, you've got your outliers, but for the most part, like coaches aren't, they're, they're going to go down the rung of of size, of age, of maturity. And so it's going to go, right? Transfer, it's going to go junior college, it's going to go high school. But if you at least know the cards that you're working with as a high schooler, you can make a much more informed decision that combines, A, where do I want to go to school? And B, where do I have an opportunity to make a difference? And that, to me, is the biggest piece of the puzzle that needs to happen when it comes to all that. Innately, the problem is the the best way to do this is completely giving high school athletes a disadvantage because it is it is everything happens in this window because you can't let what 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 is happening now doesn't work from like a college athlete experience coaches window like 
having kids having like having to enter the transfer portal before like the biggest game of the year, right? Like anybody from Washington who was like in the transfer portal just missed that opportunity, right? Like even if they weren't playing or, or Michigan who won, obviously, like they missed that opportunity because they were in the transfer portal. But if you do it the opposite, where you let high, you let the signing day period for high schoolers happen, and then you just do the spring transfer portal, then you're going to have teams who have, you know, X number of scholarships available going into the season because they had X many people transfer out, which doesn't work for the college Title IX, all the other kind of stuff that works out from a signing standpoint. So the the fairest way for everyone to get the share of that is have it all happen at the same time. So like a Jan one to to sign to NLI day um, is is that window, but innately, as Reed pointed out, college kids have tape and they have resources, whereas high school kids, unless you're you know way up there, you don't have those things, right? You don't you don't have you and there's way more the pool is way bigger, and so uh, it is innately an uphill journey for high school athletes and their and their families and. The right way to do this makes it even more of an uphill journey uh, and a battle to get in the right spot to Reed's point. Um, but this also makes the importance of having a relationship with coaches and being the right person for the right team at the right time would try and making yourself invaluable to like the next step of of whatever the coaches or these universities want, as opposed to just being a number on a list, which. Reed could talk to you for days about being a number on a list um, and like how that all works. But like, if you're just a number on the list, you're going to get cut uh, or you're going to, or, you, or someone else going to slot above you. If, if the, you know, if the talent is there. Yeah. And I mean, even, even more so lost in this is the guys that played in their bowl games. So, you know, national championship was a couple days ago, right? Yeah. And, you know, we played this just this week those guys have five days after their bowl game to say mm-hmm. that they're going to enter the transfer portal. So not, not only is there a transfer portal window for that happens right after the conference championship. So conference championship, and, and let's call it what it is. Most of the teams, and yes, this is sour grapes. Most of the teams that win their conference go on to the college football playoff next year. That will be an inevitable. Mm-hmm. You win your conference. You're one of those 12 teams. So what's going to happen next year when those 12 teams now have guys that are leaving yep. during the championship bracket season, during an even bigger time of the year? This year, it's obviously a, a big time, you know, with the four-team invitational, right? Like, that's, a, that's, the, that's the big thing. And, you know, the bowl games... Obviously, the product of the Florida State Georgia Bowl game was severely diminished by guys going to the NFL and going into the portal, right? Obviously, you can say what you want about Georgia and them playing at a high level. They still had about, I want to say, about 20 some guys that entered the portal or opted out of that mm-hmm. bowl game. So, you know, it, Florida State certainly had more, more guys that did that. But by opening that transfer portal after the conference championship, Next year, you're it's it's really going to be tough because mm-hmm. you're gonna have guys that are like, oh well, we won our group of five. You're, you're gonna have guys that are just like, oh well, I'm I'm on Liberty's team right now. Yes, we're thirteen and zero going into a bowl game, but what are our chances of winning the the title? And they're like, well, not very good. I'm going to enter the transfer portal as we're going into the playoffs. Right. You're lessening the product across the landscape. You have to move that transfer portal window. And like I said, the fact that they looked at everything over whatever time period that they looked at it and said, yeah, these are the, these are going to be the really good times to, to open the transfer portal. I understand. Like I said, I understand they have to get these kids into school. They ultimately have to get them in for the spring semester. But nobody says they have to start week one. They can ultimately start a little bit later if that's truly the case. And if it is a, and, and let's call a spade a spade here, if it is a recruit or it is somebody that was a five-star that's leaving Bama to go to Florida State, they're going to get him in. They're going to make sure that he is mm. in there. He doesn't have to, they're, they're, they're rarely 
probably checking grades of these kids. Everything is always on the up and up. You haven't heard of a kid being ineligible for class in a very long time. They're making sure that they can get into the schools that they want to get into because the product on the field has to be revenue generating. And ultimately what you saw this year, specifically that Florida State game, is that the product on the field was not revenue generating despite Mm -hmm. the 10 million plus people that tuned in to watch that game. They tuned in to watch for a specific reason. Right. And it sure wasn't because, oh, we want to see a good game. You didn't yeah. tune in for that, right? So, like, you have to make sure that the product truly works. And if it's not revenue generating, you're, you're, you're already lessening your field. And by having the transfer portal open right after conference weekend, you're certainly going to be diluting it even more. I mean, there's a case that could be made that there's more value to the student athlete and to the program to let them finish out for, if we're talking about football specifically, let them finish out the spring semester at the university. They're currently attending. Like coaches don't want that because they want, they want them on campus. They want to have time to strict conditioning. They want them to be this part of the spring games, all that jazz. Totally understand that. But from a logistics and what makes sense from a equal, at least leveling the playoff field as much as possible from a student athlete participation and experience like having that transfer portal end mid February where NLI is makes the most sense. And so then like when you could sign and so then you finish your March, April, early May, and then you move on to your next program. Now that will never happen because money, right. And just revenue and coaches and all, all, all the things that we've already talked about. But like that is the most ideal scenario in my mind from from a timing and quality of student athlete health and lifestyle. Yeah. Ultimately to the transfer portal is only it's not even open for a full month. It's Correct. not. And in and in that time frame you have two major holidays, Christmas, New Year's that you have. So you, you have to carve out, I mean, that's family time Mm -hmm. a lot for a lot of these kids. If they're part of these big time teams, they're not even going home. You know, I I wasn't part of a big time team. I played division three football. I couldn't even go home for Thanksgiving a couple of years because we were in the playoffs. So we ate Thanksgiving as a team. What do you think is happening when a kid from New York plays at Alabama or plays at Mm -hmm. Cal, right? Like he's not going home. It's not happening, right? So like, but on top of that, I think the way that they're they're going to, in speaking to your point, Justin, of how can it truly work is, you know, not just shuffling around the December scheduling. They have to move the entire season up earlier. You have a couple of week zero games where you have, you know, some teams that are stepping out. I mean, you had Florida State, LSU over the last couple of years. Mm-hmm. You'll have Florida State, Georgia Tech, and Ireland next year. There's a couple other week zeros that are going to be happening to kick the season off. Change week zero to week one. Make it week one, right? Like, and most of these teams are scheduling cupcakes anyway. There's not a lot of teams that are, you know, like I said, full bias. There's not a lot of teams that are Florida State and scheduling an LSU to have a top five matchup to start the season off right so like make week one make week zero make make it week one right and and then if you move things up and let's call it what it is as well they're already on campus all summer it's not like they're mm-hmm. home they're not home they're practicing they're all practicing every single one of them that's why you have the rules set up so that they can't wear pads until a certain time that's why you have the spring game it's why you have all of these different things they're preparing so you can certainly change the structure of things so that it fits into a schedule so that these kids don't have 28 days to enter the transfer portal, get released from their school, figure out the schools that they're now interested in, go on recruiting trips where they're flying all around the country, and then pick their new home all within a month. You got to remember, a lot of the time, these kids did that in two years when they were, or, or even more than that, right? Like they knew where they were going to go and they took their recruiting trips and their unofficials as freshmen, sophomore, juniors, and seniors. You had four years to figure out where your next home was. So ultimately, 
you now want them to figure all of that out and do all of that same thing in 28 days where they have two holidays in that time span as well. They also have to pack up all their stuff from one campus and get it somewhere else. It just doesn't make any sense to me. It really doesn't. I don't, I don't think moving it up one week makes a difference with how they're doing it. I get your logic, but I, I mean, unless they're going to move it and, and read, unless I'm missing something like unless they move it to like Jan one as your, that's when it opens which doesn't fit in with the academic schedule, but like we're going to, we're going to live in this world where it's, it's going to be after conference championships. This is when the portal opens. Um, Unless they figure out that academic thing that we've spoken about of, Hey, you don't have to be on campus day one of spring semester. Right. Cause that's, that's the buffer that they're using as their, that's what the NCAA is using as their thing because they are student first yeah, but they're Quote also unquote. using they're also using the old schedule though. Yeah, the old, no, I understand. The old schedule of things had what the the reason that there's a month off between conferences and the national championship is because that old schedule, that old BCS schedule, allowed for that. So they didn't they didn't transition when they made these things. They didn't they didn't pivot when they made these things. Stop having the national championship be a month after. Well, you, well, that won't matter watching. now with the playoffs though. It will it will now be a month after with the playoffs. Yes, but you're still continuing to play though. And if you take away yeah, early signing for twelve teams, yeah. yes. If you take away early signing, you move the transfer portal back. You you take away. I mean, you have the the conference semifinals, and I mean their 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 seasons are twelve games. Make their season 11 games. Make their season 10 games. And then you can ultimately have your conference championship be the 11th game of the season. Yeah, but the thing is, is with the 12-team playoff, you will get that revenue. They don't, they they don't, games they don't want to make up played. revenue. They don't want to make up revenue. They want but more they don't revenue. have to make up revenue because you're already slotting in these games. You're already getting those games. Now you're now what you're ultimately doing is you're you're putting 18 to I mean, let's call it what it is, 26 year olds at this point, mm-hmm. 18 to 26 year olds through the ringer of, OK, let's have a 12, 13 game, 12 game season. You play your conference championship. So you have 13 games. And now you go into the playoffs where you where you ultimately have to play what three or four more games now in order to be a national champion. So you're essentially playing an NFL schedule. Don't tell me that they're student athletes, but you're going to make them play an NFL schedule where NFL is truly their job. They wake up, they eat, sleep and breathe football outside of having other endorsements. These kids have class, you know, let's yeah. on, on the sake of being naive. Yes. They still have to go to class. So they still have to make sure their homework is done. You know, I, I mean, I, I, I can remember, you know, I obviously cover wrestling, so I'm a little bit more in tune with that. I think it was the the Princeton wrestlers um, maybe a year or two ago. They had a national champ a year or two ago. The week of the national championships, he had finals at Princeton. So he still has to balance all of that. If you ultimately want this to work, change your scheduling so that you don't have so many games and you replace those games with bowl series, right? So the bowl games now become your your championship bracket and then your other teams that are 500 that qualify for a bowl game, they get one extra game or, or whatever else. But you ultimately have to change the schedule. If you really want to truly make this work so that your coaches ha- aren't, aren't going crazy to get early signing and to get transfer portal kids in, you have to change the schedule, ultimately. I'll throw my two cents in. I was like, I'm letting Reed jump in here. <laughs> yeah, that's that's my thought. <laughs> I see both sides of the spectrum. I think to me the 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 answer that coaches would like maybe the least just because they wouldn't get kids on campus right away is to me you should have your full season. Then we should have a buffered time allotted for junior college and transfer kids to go through that portal or go through that signing. And say and that's after the season, right? So that's, you know, beginning of January through maybe the end of January or beginning of January right up until signing period in mid-February for the high school kids. And 
within that transfer portal time, you know, a lot of these kids that have signed these annual deals with with schools, you know, you still have that school paid for for that whole semester. So do you continue to go to that school and get those credits and then transfer? High, college college semesters end for a lot for a lot of schools at the end of April and the beginning of May. So you're really only talking about missing three months worth of spring ball that you wouldn't otherwise have. You're still working out with the team over in with the other place, depending on what they want to do. I mean, worst case scenario, you've got, you know, rec facilities over there that you can do, and you've probably got a coach at whatever transfer side who has a, a, a bevy of things for you to work on or things for you to do. There's also options where you can go and enroll in a community college that's near the school where you want to go play. Those those are usually more open enrollment classes. You can get credit towards the next college you're going to go to. You can be close to different, you know, to the school that you're with. Yeah, you can't officially work with them if you're at a community college, but you can they can email you workouts and you can work on things and you can call coaches and talk to them. There's ways around, you know, there's ways to, to me, it feels like whenever we make these rules on transfer portals or whatever, it feels as though, and I'd love for somebody to educate me if, if this isn't the case, the rules are made, especially on the football side, in response to whatever people were mad about the year before and not in preparation for what's going to come, right? Because we made, so we've changed these rules. Okay, great. Well, now we've got the 12 team playoff coming on. So how is really that going to adjust the window and the opportunities that, that these kids have to, to talk about? Is that, you know, now all these sort of gaps that you have to potentially have, you know, quote unquote conversations with other teams now goes away if you're on one of those 12 teams because you're building through the playoffs and you're going through that process. Whereas other kids are not going to have a ton of time because, you know, are those bowls going to run at the same time as the playoffs? Are we going to have playoff games and, you know, what does that structure look like and how can we create a system that allows for effective communication and effective tiering with that new program. Right now, all I see is a solution that they tried to jam together, taking into consideration primarily athletic directors, and then and then maybe kind of coaches, and then maybe kind of college kids, and then maybe kind of high school kids. That's sort of the tiering that it went. Yep. And the representation that they have for the kids, you know, these student athlete advisory committees, I love that they involve them. But my God, like the guy who's quoted in the press release for the for for the student athlete advisory committee for this particular rule that we're talking about that primarily talks about you know FBS FCS college football and men's and women's college basketball, the SAA chair is a former baseball player at St. Bonaventure who graduated in 2022. Like, do you think that kid has the chops? I'm sure he's smart and I'm sure he cares about what he's doing, but do you think he has the chops and or the context to be in that room and provide adequate conversation, adequate? information and, and thoughts from the student athlete population when we're talking about these things like that's the part that gets me is we're, we're just well, we're making reactive decisions rather than proactive preparation well hell like we had former guest sierra brooks right she's on last year gymnast at michigan she's on the ssa committee but like she's an active student athlete and like on a national champion gymnast team that she has to prioritize so like even if they do have representation or do have a voice in that space like they're still they're still college kids, and this is not their number one priority. It's not even probably number two priority, right? And so like, and, and yeah. we could also like we could, I could do a whole podcast on media rights and just that whole world. But like, let's be clear, they're not getting rid of games. Like they are. There's no like the number of bowl games we have this year. It is going to be that plus the additional games for the playoffs. Whoever else wants like, to sponsor it. Correct. They're, they're not. They're not getting rid of games. So the idea that, like, if we change the schedule, like, just know that if we, if we change the schedule, we're going to keep the name, same number of games or we're going to add games. There's no realm in which a, a, a Big Ten team plays 10 games instead of 12. Absolutely no no realm that's ever going to happen. So that innately gives you this window of, like, we're going to squeeze as much in from mid-August to mid-December as we can. And then stuff can happen or it's going to overlap and we're going to be in the situation we are now where kids have to make a choice either before, like after conference championships or even potentially before, given the window that we're we're moving into with the 12 team playoff. Yeah, I agree. I mean, ultimately what what I think has to happen and, and this will be the final thing that I say on it is that they have to change the schedule. If they don't change the schedule, then they're going to continue to run into diluted bowl games, diluted playoff games. Yeah. But it's not going to make a difference until it makes sense and dollars go lower. 
right? Like that's essentially is what correct is, is until the revenue starts to drop. You know, if they like I said, they I think it was ten point two five million people watch Florida State Georgia. Me being one of them because I'm a I'm a fan, but like people watch that game for a couple different reasons. And they were like, well, 10.25 million people watched it, and they still knew that there were there was going to be a ton of NFL caliber guys not out there on the field. We can continue to do what we're doing because our it's not there's no drop off. If anything, it went up. Yeah, because of and the, the problem and the yeah, hype. and meteorites are innately an exponential curve right now. Like it'll taper off eventually, but like currently, it's the only thing with value that's live. So even if we're in a position where the product is a lesser value. The the live sports or live media rights trumps that, regardless of what the value is, just because of how how valuable it is to viewers, right? Like I think, not to get too more on the media rights thing, but like a hundred of the top broad, of the hundred top broadcasts on cable television last year, eighty five of them were either NFL or college football, right? So like. We live in a world where it doesn't necessarily matter how bad the product is. Hell, the NFL had 68 quarterbacks play this year, right? Like, it's still going to do great ratings. So my thing, and I'll, 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 I'll shut up after this, but, like, if they're going to move the schedule, like, they're going to have to find a way to let these kids stay at schools in their spring year. And the scholarship point is a great point that Reed made of our, like, you have a full year. Take advantage of it. Because the only way these coaches have a fair shot at getting the right talent in is if they actually have time, not while they're coaching, to actually evaluate. And the only way it's a fair junket, fair meaning like everybody's got equal share, even though high school athletes don't have all the resources, is like letting the transfer portal and the high school NLI situation happen at the same time so that they can actually fill out rosters as opposed to this like variable amount of like who's in the portal, who's not, like oh, I, now I have these three people, now we're going to get rid of these three kids who have already committed all this all this minutia that we've cur- the current system certainly uh, brings to the forefront. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think ultimately things need to change. Reed, last word? The last thing I'll say <laughs> is that, I, in my opinion, the players need a players association, especially football right now, just given oh, the yeah. fact that it exists in its own in its own world. I think trying to ask 18 to 21 year old kids that are juggling school and sport and life and maturity and relationships and everything else to also try to be an advocate for themselves in a negotiating table with a multi-billion dollar nonprofit corporation that's been doing this for decades is an unrealistic expectation. Why are we not, why do we not have appropriate representation for those kids where, who can gather the needs and the wants and the concerns and come to the table with something tangible as opposed to we don't know what's going on, but we don't like what's going on. And the NCAA just continuing to throw the next closest thing to what they're already doing to the table and say, well, we'll try this next year and see how it goes. This should work well for you guys. You guys should figure it out. So in my opinion, appropriate representation on both sides of the table could make a much more fruitful solution that doesn't leave everyone sitting here going, how, how did we get, how was this here. the best thing that came out of the conversation? Because only one person's writing the script. That's why. Awesome. Well, I think we threw enough questions at the wall to uh, essentially someone figure it out. Uh, won't be us. That's for damn sure. But uh, I think we questioned it enough. Um, another great conversation, gentlemen. We'll, we'll continue to do these and have some fun picking apart the NCAA because that's just what people love doing these days. And uh, see you again next time. Yes, sir. Talk to you soon. Out.